Tobias, if you want, yeah, wonderful starting the recording. Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Elisa van Weimberg. I'm the co-head of uh, the economics department at SOAS University of London, and that's a job that I had the pleasure of sharing with uh, Hannah Bargawi. I'm also co-author of the briefing paper that we're launching here tonight on the World Bank Group's response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And this uh, briefing paper is the result of a collaboration between Eurodad and uh, SOAX Economics and the main findings of it will be presented here tonight by my colleague Ulan yeah, Di Macu and um, Maria Jose Romero. Uh, before I hand over to uh, Luis Vieira, who will moderate uh, the session, uh, I just wanted to say that I'm particularly excited to be here tonight on a panel that brings together colleagues from both the scholarly and the advocacy world. So we have Luis Vieira from the Bretton Woods project here. We have Cristal Simeoni from NAWI Afri, AfriFem Macroeconomics Collective. We have Daniela Gabor from the University of the West of England, Urania from uh, SOAS. And last not but not least, we have uh, Maria Jose Romero, who is both from uh, Eurodad and uh, SOAS Economics uh, Department. And I want to extend special thanks uh, to Maria Jose for having brought this exciting collection of both policy advocates and scholars uh, here uh, together around uh, the virtual table uh, tonight. So that's my very brief welcome to all of you. I'm going to hand over uh, to Louise. Please do pop your questions uh, in the chat box and these will be collected uh, for Q&A at the end uh, of the session. So over to you. Uh. Thank you very much. As uh, some of you may have heard prior to the start, the official start of the event, unfortunately my camera is not working, so it's not any effort to hide myself behind uh, a blank screen. Um, I'll keep my remarks very, very brief, but um, the speakers have been introduced. I suppose I'll just clarify the order of, of events, which will be, we'll have three presentations of about 20 minutes each. And then as Lisa mentioned, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. And as she has already introduced the speakers, I won't uh, repeat it. So without further ado, may I uh, give the floor to Rania and Maria Jose, please. You have 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me just share the presentation. Uh, with everybody. Thanks very much, Elisa and Luis. Thank you very much for these. Um, thanks everyone for joining as well to the uh, uh, panel uh, webinar where we are launching this uh, co-authored uh, briefing paper uh, with uh, Maria Jose, Elisa and myself. Never let the pandemic go to waste how the World Bank's COVID-19 response is prioritizing the private sector. Uh, we're going to kind of be sharing this presentation with Maria Jose, so I'm going to start uh, for about half uh, halfway long. Maria Jose is going to take uh, over. Okay, uh, we're going to start with putting down what's the outline of, of today's presentation, uh, starting off with essentially setting the scene uh, to then scrutinize the World Bank's response to the pandemic, setting the scene in two ways by first reminding reminding ourselves about uh, the scale and the dimension of the COVID-19 pandemic, and then as well by essentially um, uh, uh, putting down the ongoing and broader approach or strategy of the World Bank uh, Group uh, within which to then locate uh, their response to the, uh, to the pandemic, which is essentially the maximizing finance for development approach um, which uh, the broader, uh, if you will, um, agenda of the maximizing finance for development approach will also then be picked up uh, by, by Daniela in, in her presentation. And after setting the scene, um, pretty much Maria Jose is going to be doing most of this part. We're going to uh, kind of like highlight the main features of our analysis when it comes to the response uh, of the bank, particularly in terms of the um, biases and tensions within the public and the private arms of the World Bank Group within essentially uh, and the consequences of that, that is private clients versus uh, public uh, sector and, and um, 
public service uh, provision, uh, as well as look at these long-standing um, issues with um, projects that are also carried over to the COVID uh, response uh, in line with transparency, accountability, and lack of local uh, participation, uh, as well as um, we're going to be highlighting the persistence of the structural reforms agenda, and uh, we're going to then have a much clearer understanding of the conceptualization and operationalization that the group has under the broader um, ab umbrella of building back better uh, by essentially elevating the role of uh, private uh, sector uh, at the heart of uh, development and finishing this off uh, uh, by essentially reflecting many of those points uh, with a particular case study, the case study of uh, Kenya, that also links very nicely with Crystal's uh, presentation and broader contribution when it comes to um, uh, more contextualized uh, understanding of of the different projects that uh, that the group has, is uh, and the nature of the different projects that the group has been promoting and finish off the presentation with uh, um, conclusions in ter in um, terms of policy recommendations for the World Bank group. Okay, so we have uh, of course. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and particularly the, the lockdown response of many national governments has uh, led to uh, a deep recession with devastating social impacts and uh, deepening inequalities, all sorts of different uh, projections uh, about what will uh, be the future are actually quite uh, gloomy. We have the IMF that has projected uh, this to be the worst recession since the Great uh, Recession the World Bank's uh, poverty projection that suggested by 2021 an additional of about 150 million people will have fallen into extreme poverty. Uh, uh, we have the ILO that is estimating nearly half of the global workforce uh, um, standing in immediate danger of having their livelihoods destroyed and women being impacted disproportionately hard. And we also have UNTED uh, that argues there is very serious danger that this crisis will drag developing countries into another uh, lost uh, decade, hence ending any hope of delivering the um, sustainability development goals. Of course, this is the unprecedented, the one, um, uh, one in century crisis uh, um, a situation that, of course, uh, has resulted in calls for very ambitious responses different uh, national and international um, institutions, uh, ambitious responses, both in terms of scale, but also in terms of nature and type of policies uh, under the broader headline of building back better. And as I said, we're going to see what that actually means um, for the world uh, group as part of our briefing. Uh, okay. Uh, then the second element of setting the scene has to do with the maximizing finance for development, the MFD approach of the World Bank that builds on previous, of course, strategies and is part of a broader agenda and um, broader trends to attempt to elevate the private sector at the heart uh, of development, including, uh, of course, uh, public uh, service uh, provision. Now, this broader agenda that, of course, precedes the pandemic uh, is part and parcel of a series of um, other systematic uh, positionings, um, uh, not least, for instance, when it comes to the, uh, as we have seen, the unwillingness of the uh, donor community to scale up uh, their, um, their uh, public finance support the inability or unwillingness, again, to agree on a mutual resolution of unsustainable sovereign debts, uh, the lack of a, less, of, a, of, a, um, sorry, of a solution to create a global body to deal with the uh, mass uh, tax avoidance and evasion that is particularly negatively affecting uh, the global south, uh, as well as a failure of the, of the whole of the community to deal with the growing criticism and the growing negative evidence that is coming about from pursuing uh, this uh, this approach, uh, and all of the above is also um, having this underlying or uh, kind of like reflecting an underlying um, bias uh, against the public sector uh, 
uh, which has uh, uh, been also worsened by austerity policies, which themselves are um, uh, uh, restricting the capacity and the ability of the public uh, sector even further. Uh, so within uh, this, this much broader setting, if you will, we have the MFD approach, the cascade approach uh, that has been um, in 2017, uh, as, as shown in this um, uh, diagram here, which essentially um, well, uh, under, underscores that um, uh, public, uh, public concessional financing or public essential intervention should only be understood as, as a last uh, resort solution. Uh, um, all other first steps should be uh, in terms of private sector solutions, either in terms of commercial financing or in terms of upstream reforms to then deal with market failures. Or if it doesn't work again, uh, when it comes, um, well, then public um, resource support for de risking, uh, for the creation of different um, risk instruments and credit uh, enhancements that will then allow for the private sector uh, to step step up and cover or cover the the gap and then of course as i said um the public uh, uh, uh the public sector um intervention should be um the the, the last uh, step that one should should follow that the cascade approach of the of the world bank's mft and it is within this setting within okay with this crisis at hand and this particular um approach of the world bank that we will be scrutinizing uh, the response to the pandemic. Now, at the onset of the, pandem the pandemic in March of 2020, uh, the World Bank Group issued um, an emergency response uh, package of 14 uh, billion uh, dollars. Uh, and then as the uh, crisis was um, unfolding, uh, the group has um, uh, committed uh, further uh, further funds uh, of about 160 billion dollars uh, by June 21, fifth of which should uh, be going for the um, um, of the for the for leaks right for the um, uh, for the less income uh, countries and uh, then a further of 330 or 350 um, billion uh, dollars by June. 2023. So that's part of the pledge of the medium to long, long term ple pledge of the of the bank in light of the consequences of this unprecedented um, crisis. The focus of our briefing is actually on the emergency response. Um, um, so the COVID emergency response of this 14 billion, which um, th that's the second part of this graph here, which ha highlights uh, one of our first. Uh, the findings, uh, if you will, uh, that has you with um, uh, the allocation of this emergency package across the public uh, arm and the private arm of the World Bank, uh, the IBRD and IDA, the public uh, side um, got six billion uh, of this uh, emergency package, while the IFC, the private uh, arm, uh, eight billion. Both sides, including the IFC. Uh, received as well as part of this of their emergency uh, packages, uh, they also included um, components of the unallocated um, IDA's private sector uh, window uh, funding. Um, now, this is all indicative, if you will, of our first finding: the fact that we see a preference, one could say a bias. Um, uh, towards uh, private clients over uh, the public sector, as this is reflected in the allocation across the public, right, the IBRD or, uh, and the IDA, uh, and the private IFC arms of the World Bank Group. So about 60% of the emergency COVID resources were allocated to the IFC, right, to the private uh, arm of the World Bank, which is at odds, as an allo this allocation itself is at odds um, with um, uh, multiple calls across the policy spectrum for stronger uh, public uh, systems, uh, as has also been echoed by the G24's communique of, of yesterday in the uh, in the annual meetings, 
uh, but it, this is also at odds with traditional trends within uh, the World Bank or previous, if you will, allocations within the World Bank group, uh, whereby the IFC has, has always been receiving a much, much a smaller uh, proportion of the uh, financing resources uh, of the group. Or in other words, the pandemic has essentially um, uh, led to an expansion in the upstream work of the IFC and has also accelerated uh, the disbursement of uh, the disbursement of blood uh, of the private um, arm of the bank. Okay, uh, and I think now is uh, the time for um, Maria Jose to take over. Thank you, thank you, Rania, um, Elisa, and, and everyone uh, here um, for being with us today. Um, I will uh, finish the presentation um, here. Um, this slide you will see um, what's also uh, one of our main findings, because this is the result of quite a lot of uh, intense work by Urania and the three of us trying to identify exactly who benefits from IFC projects. Because we, we knew in April that the IFC received these 8 billion, but we were very uh, interested in knowing exactly who actually uh, benefited from, from this money. And what um, we found out is that, um, first, first of all, um, uh, the financial sector um, was already um, prioritized in the design uh, of the different facilities that the World Bank, um, that the IFC uh, used to disperse this money. So the IFC um, organized uh, four different um, uh, facilities to channel this, uh, these resources, and three of them were dedicated to, the, to support the financial sector. So um, uh, three um, of these um, facilities um, um, include uh, the financial sector, and this is the first uh, pie chart that you um, find um, in front of you. Secondly, we also try to see, okay, what's um, what's the type of um, uh, companies that that are benefited from um, from um, the IFC support? What sectors? In addition to the financial sector, okay, um, uh, what other companies? And um, we also did quite a, um, an intense portfolio analysis. And um, as of um, uh, mid-August, the figures disclosed by the IFC tell us that by, uh, the, by uh, late June 2020, 68% of the um, um, money that the, the IFC approved went to the financial sector. And the rest of that went to uh, real sector companies that were um, um, or active in the private healthcare, um, agribusiness, um, and processing companies, and uh, tourism companies. So there we see, um, again, that in how the um, IFC um, channeled the money in the first uh, four months of the pandemic, there was a high priority, um, a high presence of the of, um, uh, the financial sector. And finally, we also try to identify what type of companies um, were 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 these. And um, our analysis shows that um, half of the companies were either majority um, owned um, by uh, multinational companies or were international um, conglomerates themselves. And the other half were mostly uh, locally uh, owned companies, but usually large companies. And in our briefing, we present um, uh, some of the examples of these type of companies. But clearly, our findings point to the fact that there was uh, no uh, presence of um, a small, a small companies um, uh, in terms of um, um, the companies that benefited from IFC um, support. Uh, next, um, we also, let me see. Yes, I, I run through too. Okay. I'd like to let you know that you only have about three minutes. 
Okay, that's thank you very much. This will be run the rest of the presentation. Okay, so the thing uh, in relation to how this money is actually being channeled and in relation to implementation, our main um, point has to do with the lack of transparency, um, lack of accountability and local participation in how um, the World Bank as a group has been ch ch um, channeling um, these resources. Um, first, when it comes to the IFC, the focus on financial intermediary uh, points to a lack of transparency and accountability. Um, there, um, there is no uh, clear indication of how these uh, facilities that target the financial sector um, will actually reach the final, um, the final beneficiary. Um, so this is a, a concerning point. And secondly, when it comes to World Bank um, uh, operations, uh, um, so the ones uh, channeled through um, IBRD and, and IDA, there is um, they are a problem with very limited to no stakeholder engagement, um, um, and this adds to the very uh, problematic uh, situation in many countries where um, there is a shrinking uh, space for CSOs to actively participate. Uh, next has to do with the structural reforms uh, to promote uh, market market creation. And this is something that we um, um, have identified in several uh, World Bank um, uh, operations that were not uh, uh, the ones directed to the health um, emergency. So um, the, the World Bank um, approved operations that were uh, actually focused on the, the health emergency, uh, but others uh, were operations that the World Bank also um, included in its response to the crisis. But these were operations that um, were with a broader focus, and in some of them it was evident that uh, um, there was a, a push for liberalization, deregulation, and a reduced role of the state. And in our briefing, we all include uh, specific references to the cases of Ethiopia, Kenya, Indonesia, Ecuador, etc. And as um, we know from the um, evidence, um, some of these policies have resulted in adverse uh, developmental and health outcomes and negative impacts on gender equality. Um, next uh, comes the point of building back better and how the World Bank is planning to uh, respond respond to the crisis also in what is called the recovery phase, not just the emergency phase, but the recovery phase. Um, there, um, we um, have also been able to clearly identify the um, uh, central role that the private sector will play in this, um, in, in this part of um, the, the World Bank uh, response. Just to inform you that your colleagues have kindly given you an extra 10 minutes, so you can okay. pace yourself a bit. That's fine. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, the point here is to um, um, is to say that um, the World Bank is set to accelerate and scale up um, its support for uh, the private sector, including um, through advisory service, uh, policy guidelines, finance um, for different uh, PPP uh, projects around the world, um, and that the, the World Bank is, is, is doing so um, with the understanding that this will be uh, what it will take us out of the, out of the crisis. Um, and this also makes a, a, um, a good link um, in, our, in our briefing and in this presentation with uh, what um, Daniela is going to present next that has to do with the Wall Street, uh, what she calls the Wall Street uh, consensus, um, meaning that the, the, the MFT approach that Urania presented um, uh, is, is, is one that successfully embeds the, the private sector across uh, core public service provisioning. And this is what the World Bank um, has on the table um, uh, in its uh, intervention um, with countries and with the private sector. And we included in our presentation um, a quote that comes from the interim IFC CAO, and um, this was um, said yesterday 
in response to a specific uh, question in relation to the future of the of the MFD, in light of all the different problems that we have um, uh, seen, and and they are uh, indeed, as you can see there, very determined to move forward with this approach. So. Um, um, our, our cascade approach, in words of the IFC, is more relevant now than ever. We need to leave the fiscal space uh, for the poor and vulnerable. The IFC teams um, are engaged and involved with World Bank colleagues to help private sector back on its feet. This is what the World Bank um, group is, is actually uh, doing, reforming sectors and countries to welcome the private sector. This is despite evidence regarding multiple risks and implications of, of, of PPPs. Fiscal cost, um, uh, the, the, the fiscal risk, the high cost, and the questionable evidence, um, the, the questionable uh, effectiveness and equity implications of the model as such. And, and here I will just give uh, some uh, brief uh, references to uh, what we found in the case of Kenya. And for sure, Crystal will um, speak about this in a more um, eloquent uh, uh, way um, for leaving this um, from her first-hand experience. Uh, but we uh, uh, have been able to identify several ways in which the World Bank has been working with um, uh, the government uh, of Kenya to uh, move uh, forward the implementation of the, of the MFD. And this um, has to do with several loans that were approved since um, early um, uh, um, uh, 2010. But of course, we can get back to previous years, and this was also very evident then. Um, but in, in all these loans, we, we, we have identified technical support to pass a new PPP law that was approved, um, support for the preparation of individual uh, PPP projects, um, um, and as of January this year, um, all this work has translated into a pipeline of 80 PPP projects in different sectors, including transport, energy, but also health and, and, and education. Um, and these are um, uh, projects that, as um, Crystal and colleagues have analyzed, have been very problematic uh, projects. Uh, when it comes to serving people, um, uh, the, the people that should, should be served. Uh, in the context of COVID-19, the World Bank has continued with this approach um, in the case of Kenya, um, with a specific policy reforms, the structural reforms I mentioned before, um, and uh, with the IFC support to the financial sector. Um, now I will close with uh, the recommendations, the policy recommendations that we include in the paper. Um, we include short-term policy recommendations uh, for what we think that um, it would be important to do um, uh, to first uh, and foremost uh, restore the balance between the public and the private sector in, in the World Bank COVID-19 response including in its modalities and, and instruments. Um, second, um, um, uh, both in, in, in the emergency response uh, and in the long-term finance, um, um, it's, uh, it's critical that the World Bank Group uh, abandon the policy uh, conditions that favor the private sector and undermine the strengthening of public services and the, public, and the delivery of, of public goods. Um, and uh, also uh, make sure that its emergency and long-term uh, programs are consistent with and strengthen climate resilient, uh, resilience and the shift to low-carbon uh, pathway if uh, the World Bank is actually committed to a resilient uh, future this should be uh, on the table um, and, and finally when it comes to the IFC we mentioned in our uh, briefing that is important to get information um, about the ultimate uh, recipient um, of, of the IFC support. Uh, and we also mentioned that uh, it's important that the IFC stop uh, its support for commercial uh, private health facilities that undermine public health systems 
and, and, and have uh, negative consequences for people on, on the ground. And long-term approach, we, we um, uh, see that um, the World Bank should use um, this opportunity if, if, if there is a, um, a way of saying that this um, a very tremendous crisis um, is an opportunity and to reevaluate um, its um, MFD approach in light of all the, the, the evidence on the table. Um, the World Bank has also a role to play in refocusing the international discussion on blended finance, which actually means the use of aid money to leverage uh, the, the private sector. Uh, is that the right use of ODA money? Okay, the World Bank has a role to play in this debate, and building back better requires a human rights-based approach that builds resilience and strengthens public systems um, um, as a whole. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for taking long. That was perfectly timed, actually, with the kind uh, support of your colleagues. So without further ado, may I uh, give the floor to Daniela, please? Thanks. Uh, yeah, and can you hear me? Before doing so, yeah, Danielle, just a reminder to those of you following the session that you're welcome to post your any questions that you have in the chat so that um, as you're thinking about what's being said, the chat box is open for questions. Thank you. Sorry, Danielle. Yeah, OK. Uh, so thank you for inviting me into this session. Um, I, I was just reminded by Crystal Simeone, who's going to speak after me that I am, still, I am still team PowerPoint, I'm sorry, Crystal, um, but I'm, I'm, I have a, a justification for it. I'm going to show you some graphs um, and some numbers on what is happening to uh, the maximizing finance for development or what I call the Wall Street consensus uh, this year since the global pandemic has hit. And just a reminder, I think the way that I like to frame this question of uh, what I think is, a, if we take a step back, is a sort of paradigm shift in international development is with this quote, quote from the uh, former World Bank Group president. Uh, and it's a quote that explains how the World Bank sees the logic of maximizing finance for development. And that has to do with the risking projects, the risking sectors, and the risking entire countries. And this is important. I think the risking is at the core of this new um, development paradigm. And it's, to my mind, it's a reinvention or a reframing of what we know as the Washington Consensus, the famous uh, trinity of privatized, liberalized, and st stabilized that the World Bank uh, was famous for in the 1980s and 1990s. Now, uh, the Wall Street Consensus updates this paradigm. It keeps its ideological foundations, but it updates this the Washington Consensus for an age of financial capitalism. And I think this is very important to take into account that when uh, the World Bank talks about the private sector, although you will hear their representatives talking about small and medium enterprises, about private, the private sector in poor countries, mostly the kind of private sector they have in mind as partners for uh, achieving the sustainable development goals, they, they are talking about private finance from the global north. Uh, they are talking about particularly institutional investors that have trillions of uh, US dollars, uh, mostly, or other currencies, that they can redirect or they can uh, uh, put into developmental assets uh, with the right kind of um, de-risking instruments. And this, uh, oh, let me see, uh, this logic um, I call uh, the Wall Street consensus. See, Crystal, what's happening when you do PowerPoint uh, and then use them on Blackboard, they, they kind of, uh, uh, boundaries get out of shape. Uh, the Wall Street consensus has, to my mind, two important pillars. And, and I think uh, I, I like to think about the, both, both these pillars together because they highlight how important it is to take into account the sort of overall um, uh, age of financial capitalism that is shaping the way in which development interventions are being uh, reimagined uh, today. And the, uh, the first uh, pillar of this uh, Wall Street consensus is to say that uh, in order to achieve the sustainable development goals, uh, there is a funding gap, and this funding gap can be closed if we are um, going to create a public, uh, a private partnership with private finance in order to attract a financing into uh, SDG um, projects 
And the logic there is that one has to accept that public goods like um, public infrastructure, like renewable energy, like, like health, like education, like roads, can best be delivered if it is quasi-privatized via public-private partnerships. This is, I think, what uh, the, the um, IFC um, um, representative that Maria Jose quoted earlier meant when she said that we have to uh, leave the, the, the smaller and smaller fiscal space that countries have for the most needy uh, and think about uh, closing the SDG funding gap public-private partnerships that are financed by um, global bondholders. And this is why I think it's important also to bear in mind that uh, the, the Wall Street consensus, like the Washington consensus, is a state-building project. It doesn't kick the state out, it just reimagines the way in which the state behaves in development interve interventions or in economic activity altogether. And I call this reimagining the de-risking state. The state is expected to redirect fiscal resources into the risking for a series of risks that appear in PPP projects. You can find them and in, in the paper that Maria Jose referred to uh, that I, uh, I have written this here on the Wall Street consensus. I go through the series of risks that matter for, from demand risk, for example, if um, tolls are not paid on, on highways and cannot uh, and these tolls cannot be used to service uh, the bondholders that have financed this highway, then the state will uh, guarantee that uh, this demand risk is, it doesn't affect the private investor. There are a series of risks, I don't want to bore you with them, but very important, there is an ima reimagining of the, the role of the state moving away from the collective provision of the goods through state-owned uh, uh, public infrastructure towards the risking privatized or quasi-privatized infrastructure constructed in partnership with the private, se the private sector. And the, the second uh, pillar of this is the, the sort of a grand bargain, if you want, with a private finance with institutional investors who have trillions. This is why the maximizing finance for development agenda is also known as the, the billion to trillion agenda. And the logic is here that in order for uh, poor countries to close the SDG gap, they need very significant investments. These investments can, uh, uh, can occur if uh, the trillions of institutional investors from the global north, and here I mean my, my, my pension fund, it can be my, an insurance company, it can be uh, a sovereign wealth fund, all these could be escorted towards a, um, Development, new development asset classes uh, in the global south by uh, creating more and more investable or bankable projects, right? So there is also, a, uh, uh, the Wall Street consensus is also a project of structural transformation, not of the manufacturing sector as we had in the developmental state uh, age, but the structural transformation of local financial systems moving away from bank-based financial systems towards bond-based financial systems, that is, financial systems where credit creation occurs to markets as opposed to directly on the balance sheet of, of commercial banks. Okay, and uh, you can see, and I'm using here the example of Sub-Saharan Africa because some of the discussions that I want to have uh, or some of the insights of how this Wall Street consensus is behaving in the COVID-19 pandemic uh, are very well uh, sort of illustrated by the negotiations around uh, Sub-Saharan Sub African um, uh, debt uh, negotiations. Uh, here you can see from this graph that uh, I took from uh, 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 Brad Setzer, who, and you can the entire blog there, you can see in the uh, sort of dark yellow um, uh, bits of this graph, you, you can see that bond-based finance is increasingly important for, uh, even for countries that are known in private markets as frontier countries. And what they mean by frontier countries is countries that don't have an investment grade uh, uh, rating for their um, dollar uh, uh, bonds, but they, they becoming increasingly attractive because we live in a world of very low yields in, in the global north because of central bank interventions. So you, can, you have to find the yield where you can. So And the idea is that uh, the, the logic of the maximizing finance for development is to make this yellow, these dark yellow bits here increasingly larger uh, and to uh, make sure that, that, that they finance 
uh, SDG related um, projects. Okay, and you will see incidentally, I want to spend a lot of time on this, that this bond-based finance is much smaller than, than the Chinese uh, in, um, flow development or commercial flows into, into sub-Saharan Africa. And this matters for, for the story that I'm going to tell you in a couple of months. And I know I've given Maria Jose my five, uh, five minutes, but I don't know how long uh, I've gone. So Luis, keep me on track. So what has happened with the, with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic for the Wall Street consensus? At first, I thought that this would have been a, a pretty serious um, hit to the Wall Street consensus in the sense that public-private partnerships uh, require the state to commit uh, uh, public resources, that is fiscal resources, to the risk uh, PPP project if uh, something goes wrong and risks that are written in this in the legal contracts materialize and with the covid-19 pandemic a lot of these risks materialized simply because people were locked in their houses in in, in many places they could not pay hospital fees they could not pay um, a, a, a highway tolls uh, they some of them cannot pay for renewable energy so i i i thought that uh, perhaps this uh, the covid-19 pandemic would lead to a rethink of the importance of ppps in uh, the new development paradigm that the world bank is pushing but of course uh, i was a believe and an optimistic in this that is uh, definitely not the case we know now that uh, despite the the fact that in the initial stages of the pandemic uh, the budgets have gone uh, have expanded and public spending has expanded uh, dramatically across emerging and poor countries uh, towards public health the the accent uh, now is back again and the emphasis is back again on private provision of a uh, social infrastructure uh, and uh, I'm sure that um, crystal can tell you a lot more about that um, and uh, although there were some there is some recognition that of course uh, there is more transparency needed in order to work out much is the state paying in order for these ppps to uh, uh, remain profitable for private investors we don't know uh, that is simply something that is not available i haven't been able to find any significant uh, a sort of material that comes from the World Bank that says for this PPP project, this is how much the state had to take on. Maybe we will see some of this um, uh, next year once the COVID-19 pandemic effects are, are clearer. What I think is also coming uh, is a new wave of conditionality and structural adjustment in this Wall Street consensus. So it's going to increasingly more and more like the Washington consensus. But what we will have is green conditionality in the sense that the World Bank uh, internal debates uh, that I know of are discussing the idea that if there is additional support provided to countries, then they have to make, uh, the World Bank wants to make sure that they are consistent with a low carbon transition. What that means uh, is, a, is a whole can of worms that needs to be uh, opened and unpacked. Um, it's not very clear that the World Bank still has a lot of power to do that. Here I, I'm showing you a tweet, uh, of a, and I'll let Crystal uh, discuss this, but just to say that there are countries uh, in the Global South that are, going, that are seeing the PPP logic of the Wall Street consensus as a very important way uh, forward in order to increase infrastructure investment. And this is from a PPP in a um, highway in Kenya, and the, the Kenyan uh, parliament passed a, or approved the toll fund, which will basically de-risk um, this PPP for a, a, a volatility in demand and volatility in, in toll um, revenue. Um, so not much has changed on this front. Uh, what what uh, actually, to my mind, has become even starker and clearer is the way in which uh, a very strong power imbalance uh, uh, it has been hardwired between private finance and particularly bondholders and bond finance and uh, poor countries through the, this logic of the Wall Street consensus that says we can become uh, we can become your development partners as long as uh, you de-risk or you change the risk return profile of the developmental assets that you want us to to finance. And what we know from uh, the past for for the past. Uh, six to seven months, um, the poor countries uh, in the global, I'm using global south as a, a, an umbrella term, knowing uh, the, the problems with that. What we know is that uh, poor countries, the G20, uh, the World Bank and other multilateral development banks have, have negotiated what is known as the uh, debt service suspension initiative, which says that poor countries, because of COVID-19 and because of the pressures on public budgets, they have a, a liquidity problem 
which uh, uh, is not necessarily a solvency problem and what they need is some help uh, with that liquidity problem so they shouldn't be asked to pay uh, to service their debt that uh, that is both the principal and the interest rate they shouldn't be asked to to, to service their debt and the agreement was in April, to, in to, to April 2020 the agreement was that for six months uh, official bilateral uh, loans from the G20 countries to uh, the DSSI eligible countries would not be serviced. Uh, according to the World Bank, this means around 5 billion uh, in fiscal space, and I'm using this between quotation marks uh, because it's not very clear that it's created additional fiscal space. Uh, but what we know is there hasn't been any, although the G20 invited private bondholders to, to, to voluntarily engage with countries in the SSI initiative, uh, there has been absolutely no response. Uh, on the contrary, instead of participating, what we know now from one of the uh, lobby groups, International Institute for Finance, which is the sort of global association of private finance, sent a letter a couple of weeks ago to the G20 in preparation for the meeting that is happening today uh, between ministries, ministers of finance and governors of central banks of the G20. And the IIF has sent this letter, and this is a letter that uh, draws on the logic of the Wall Street consensus, draws on the logic of the of the grand bargain, uh, private finance for de for development, to say uh, here are two carrots and here is a stick, uh, and we will threaten. It's a to my mind, it's a very overt threat from the from the IIF towards the G20 of what can happen if there is a mandatory. Uh, involvement of the private sector basically if the g20 countries say the private sector has to shoulder some of the burden uh, of um, the liquidity problems that poor countries are facing they should be also joining the official sector or the taxpayers in, in high income countries in providing some liquid temporary liquidity for poor countries and let me tell you what are these two carrots and one stick and why i think uh, the, the Wall Street consensus is going to become even more important uh, and, and a very useful rhetorical tool for private finance to use. Um, Daniela, just to give you a heads up that you probably should be wrapping up. I'm okay. wrapping up. Okay. So the, the, okay. the, the two carrots that have been used by the, the this uh, lobby association are the SDG funding gap. You cannot, the argument is you cannot close this uh, SDG funding gap without uh, the trillions of institutional investors. And even more important, uh, we know that there is a fundamental shift in uh, or rethinking of the uh, portfolio composition of institutional investors in high income countries. That is, there is a turn towards sustainability understood as a turn towards uh, investments that have higher environmental, social, and governance ratings. And the logic is here, we can give, we can make sure that this turn towards sustainability benefits poor countries as long as the poor countries do not uh, uh, threaten us with mandatory participation in, in these uh, debt uh, relief initiatives. And here comes very quickly the stick that is, uh, apologies, I went a bit too fast, the stick that is being used, which is market access, and this stick is very, has been very powerful in, in, in many capitals of, of countries. And the, lo the logic here is, if you coerce us into participating into uh, temporary debt relief, what will happen is uh, you won't be able to borrow in uh, uh, international bond markets and you might have a, um, a capital flight and a currency crisis on your hands. So a very powerful kind of combination of, of threats and promises based on the logic of the Wall Street consensus to say uh, you have to take a lot of pain now and you might gain uh, some uh, maximizing finance for development uh, uh, brownie points later and we know that this uh, has been um, this matters because there are several countries Kenya is one of them that have decided not to apply to, to, to the DSSI although according to the World Bank they are at high risk of, of debt distress precisely because they do not want to jeopardize market access uh, in, in, in case they will not be able to service here in orange the uh, debt on uh, their euro bonds and we are seeing here I'm finishing now. Yes, I'm okay. finishing. Uh, we are seeing here uh, that this also has created the, the, the conflicts within uh, 
I mean, we all know that the, there isn't a that poor countries do not speak with one one voice. But the logic here is that more and more countries are joining the market access camp because the threats of of private bondholders are, are very powerful. And I would suggest that you read the, the op-ed that the Ghanaian Minister of Finance has published a couple of days ago, saying what we need here, uh, is, what we need in order to deal with a debt crisis at the end is more of the Wall Street consensus. Uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately for either Kenya or, or Ghana, the problem is that even if they hadn't joined the DSSI, they are, their uh, bonds are not doing better than the countries that have uh, done so. Okay, I'll stop here, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick reminder again that you can please um, place your questions in the chat, but um, may I give the floor to Crystal? Thank you. Thanks, Louise, um, and thank you so much for having me. Um, it's such an honor to speak with everybody here, and this is a webinar that has a little extra pressure because my mom is on here. She's always telling me to speak slow, so mom, I'm going to try and speak slower. Um, and so, taking on from both MJ and Daniela, and I'll give the example of, of Kenya as I, as I go through, and I'll start off talking about how, you know, the more things change, the more they say, stay the same. And Kenya remains a shining light for the world that really um, our oppression. And as Daniela put, you should go through a lot of pain now um, and things will get better. Well, we've been going through a lot of pain for many, many years. And so I'll put things in perspective and give you a little bit of a brief through history um, for Kenya. Uh, we gained independence from, from the UK in 1963. And up until 1993, in terms of healthcare, and I'll, and I'll focus on healthcare um, in my intervention, we had a range of, of, of measures introduced to healthcare. And one of them was user fees. And the introduction of user fees are applied at each point of service and are paid directly by health seekers to access a very specific service. Um, so the earliest ambitions for universal health coverage were part of an overarching development policy for post independence Kenya. Um, and in fact, the removal of user fees before um, just post independence, um, two years after independence, was a reversal of very discriminative colonial um, user fees that we as Kenyan, especially Africans on in the country, had to had to pay. Um, the user fees just after after independence were scrapped, um, but then we saw a reintroduction of the same fees in 1989, and this was under the Structural Adjustment Program. So again, you see it's a colonial, almost neo-colonial imposition of, of, of a you know, payment system and, and a user fee imposed on, on, African, on Kenyan citizens. Um, and since then, the Kenyan health sector has really just relied on out of pocket payments for most levels of care. And so here you see us moving from what, some, what people have called the Washington Consensus and its imposition of user fees within health in Kenya, and, and um, move to now present day Kenya when we're in seeing what Daniela terms as the Wall Street Consensus and the rise of public private partnerships. And what does this mean? Is, is privatization of a lot of our healthcare. It means that again, user fees are not only implemented, but also on the rise. Um, it is also widely documented how the economy and social impacts of SAPs disproportionately affected women, and they continue to do the same in our current iteration of what is now termed the Wall Street Consensus. And so we've seen the collapse of publicly delivered social services and infrastructure increased through women's unpaid care and domestic work burdens, low-skilled public sector services, and jobs um, which employed mostly women have been lost. Uh, user fee payments and cost sharing also very heavily on women. And health facilities were previously on average, you know, six or seven kilometers away from most households, um, have now been closed down and women have to, you know, walk an extra distance to, to access them and access very privately managed um, healthcare facilities. Um, and so if we've heard stories of, you know, women required to buy gloves and surgical blades and disinfectants and syringes as they go to hospitals to have babies. And this brings to what we mean when we privatize our healthcare. And because um, these hospital facilities are way too expensive for all women to afford these services, we then offer traditional birth attendants, and which means that our maternal mortality rates are shooting off the roof. And so I'll move to, you know, the more, um, the feel of what this means. And, and it, 
really linked to our living memory. And with African countries having a youth bulge and a large percentage of our populations know what quality and universal health services looks like. Um, I'm in my 30s and I don't remember a time where I've been to a public health care facility that's run with quality services. And so all that I know is private health care. In a nation like Kenya, where three quarters of the population is under 35 years old, one can assume has been our, as, as has been our experience means that the vast majority of us don't see very many alternatives for private finance to solve our public problems such as health care. And we've interviewed a number of young people and they will always say, you know, um, private health care is, is what we what we try and achieve because public public funded hospitals are understaffed, don't have enough medicines, um, and just with the waiting lines are too long and, and you don't get quality health care. And so PPPs have been seen to be more costly than public funded services, but they're lacking in transparency, they're driven by profit margins, and bottom lines with virtually all risk, as Daniela puts it, falling on the public uh, our governments continue to pursue them. And the tweet that Daniela showed was one of our government's advisory advisors. Um, and really brought into this privatization of our public services. And really what it does is pushes a narrative that the African state is incapable for providing public services and goods. And this really speaks to the heart of a broken down social contract over the years. And we can see it moving from world um, uh, sparked contracts, uh, uh, a colleague and mine have just finished writing a paper on a managed equipment scheme project in the country where our government has been leasing specialized equipment for hospitals across the country. Two years ago, it was our third highest health budget line um, and, and at the expense of every other service. And we can see the repercussions of, of that now as we go to COVID, where a majority of our funding that shouldn't be used for from maternal health care to public health has been used to pay for these loans and, and to pay for these to service these contracts that we signed. Contracts are not um, transparent in any way possible. And so it's been really hard to find any information around what we signed up for. There's questions around how how our governments and these PPP contracts um, choose what is priority over another issue. And so if maternal health care is in Portable. Oh, sorry, I'm hearing strange noises here. And so, if maternal health care isn't profitable for private intervention and private investment, and that so it's just off the table. And so, we see a rise of this. And the tweet that Daniela showed was a, you know, an uprise of comments about our president just this last month um, um, visiting France and signing a number of PPP agreements. Um, one of them was a mega highway which is one of the biggest PPP agreements in Eastern Africa. Um, there's a number of different contracts around upgrading our central business district and, and electricity transmission lines. And questions again in terms of how these were chosen and whose priorities speak to. Um, does it speak to the priorities and needs of our developmental um, trajectories and who decides? Least of all, women sitting at the table of decision making and feeding into priority structure is really something that we we consider you know a real gap in the issue and so really like i said the more things change the more they stay the same and we can call it the wall street consensus which has taken over from the washington consensus the same the same strategies of oppression and of extraction continue to stay the same um africa continues to to be at the mercy of finance which sits at part of development of our countries, um, which private investment and profit first before our people. And like Jason Hickel, our economy isn't working for its people, then who exactly does it work for? And so, um, you know, there's questions around how we can harmonize, for example, our PPP um, units and legislation across the continent to say that, you know, we all stick with these bare minimums if you're going to come in. What does that look like with an African Union that is so heavily funded by the EU and whose decisions are really within our very own African Union is, question, is a question that I have all the time. Um, but mostly it speaks to a global governance system that is very undemocratic, that is non-inclusive, that is extremely exclusive, um, made up of you know, a group of 
richer countries, taking advantage of, of, of poorer countries in the global system, and making sure that there's a profit generated um, from them. And the, this is this is really thinking about people's lives. There's the technical element, as Daniela and MJ put to the table, of these economic decisions, but at the very heart of it is speaking to people's lives, speaking to the possibility of whether I can go to a public hospital and and why must I pay for private solutions for public problems. Um, it's a difference between those those around me who have children and what sort of schools their children go to and how much of the money they have to pay and save up to make sure that they can afford to go to school. Uh, it's a difference between, you know, a professor I was speaking to on the continent who has to pay what they're calling a black tax is to pay for private solutions for public problems and taking on any con consultation consult consultancy job comes across just to be able to pay for his mother to go to a private hospital pay for somebody to go to private school um, so it also speaks to our ability to really have our own African narrative and what that means and where there's space for it um, yeah so I'll stop there Um, thank you, Crystal. I'm, I'm, I think that perhaps Louise is facing a technical challenge. Uh, Louise, can you hear or speak to us or not at all? Uh, it seems we may have lost our moderator. Ah, Louise. I can't hear Louise. So perhaps I... I I take over from here, given that our moderator seems to have encountered a blackboard hurdle. Um, thank you, Cristal, and, and everyone else. I I'm, was particularly struck by the way in which Cristal's contribution mediates the, the, the kind of macro issues that have been raised, the kind of global political economy, the global policy space, etc. how that's uh, being continuously redefined and in which there is very particular, powerful private interests that are defining uh, how that policy is being heard and, and what that then ultimately means, uh, you know, on the ground in practice in terms of daily experiences of, of access uh, to health or the type of uh, access that is brokered, what norms on the conditions people have, have access over. Thanks a lot, uh, Crystal, for, you know, closing the loop, if you want, in terms of bringing all these elements together for the specific case of, of, of healthcare provisioning uh, in Kenya. And I was also particularly struck by this proposition you, 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 you put at the heart of, of what you say is that that narrative that is being uh, promoted that African states are incapable of providing quality public services. And at the same time, we have these very powerful private interests being promoted via the Wall Street consensus uh, in, in, in redefining how we can uh, reimagine, if you want, the, the, the uh, global policy and hence specific uh, policies at the um, uh, at country. Now, I am looking at the chat um, box. I see that Elena has raised a question uh, for Cristal, um, whether you could please expand on the mention of, on, on, on how you mentioned that there is need to create an African narrative. So perhaps, Crystal, do you want to pick that up? Sure. Uh, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK. Um, yes, there's, there's been um, this, um, a movement of pan-Africanism over the years. And that has that's a narrative and a notion that has changed. Um, nothing stays constant and, stati and static. Um, but, you know, with changing times and we're not colonized as we were, you know, pre-60s anymore, but it's a different kind of um, colonialism, if you will. And I think there has to be an acknowledgement that there needs to be space for Africans to create their own narrative, not sometimes it needs a stepping back. Um, we're all fighting. I, I like to say this a lot and apologies to those who've heard me say it. But we're all fighting the same war, but the battles can be very different. And we have different roles to play in, play in this battle all towards economic justice. And so, for example, Africa loses $100 billion to illicit financial flows. 
currently tax regulation and frameworks are, are decided upon by the OECD, um, of which African countries don't have a seat at that table in formulating these frameworks, but at the same time have a huge impact on our ability to do our own taxing rights and our ability to collect domestic resource mobilization. And so ATF African Tax Administration Forum have been working to build um, African model legislation and policy that are retrofit for us. And this is an example of what we need in terms of um, give us just have a little bit of space to analyze the problem as defined by us and decide what alternatives and how can we reimagine alternatives and what those look like um, in a global economy. Um, and so that's what I mean. Uh, a Pan-African movement that is growing, there's organizations like Tax Justice Network Africa, AfroDad, Trust Africa, that are continuously building into this new narrative of pan African thinking around what economic justice could look like. Um, much different from some of our partners in the global north. A lot of the time, there's synergies and there's points of solidarity. Um, but I, I strongly feel um, because we are there's already fodder there for a pan African narrative, um, it, 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 it it translates and and looks differently for us. And I think we need to have the space to develop that a little bit more. Um, there's also a question on the should I stop there? Or there's another question that I see. no please, Crystal, continue. So yes, there is a question by from Sarah for you also. The implications on healthcare workers in terms of where they can find jobs and migration as they seek better jobs than those that they can find in public health care sectors, whether in, Af in Kenya or other African countries. Yeah, so for healthcare workers, um, I have I've worked closely with, with the doctors union in Kenya for a number of years, not directly with them, but I support a lot of the work that they do. I've been on demonstrations and marches with them on the street. Um, simply because I see, I see you go through. I did my master's in Sweden, and so I know what a functioning health system could look like. Um, and I wonder why it, doesn't, it isn't the same um, for me in my country. Um, but I know it's a very complex system um, to very local problems that have sometimes very global solutions. And those global solutions manifest in, you know, a global governance system of our economy. Um, but with with the doctors, they, they get trained, um, they go through a very rigorous training here. But the conditions and the remuneration that they receive are, are abysmal um, once they're finished with their training. And so you will see, I think there was a statistic that something like the UK or Europe has more doc Kenyan doctors than we do um, in Kenya. And we've seen the importation of, just as you would commodities, we've seen the importation of Cuban doctors, even now as we go through COVID. Um, and this comes with a back, against a backdrop of Kenyan doctors that are not paid enough, that um, are operating in hospitals that have almost no, no, no equipment and medicine. And a doctor friend of mine said she quit, she quit um, her, her practice and said, I wasn't trained um, for this medicine where I just watch over people dying. I can't do it anymore. And so there's a lot of is leaving. There's a whole movement of doctors and nurses, well, a majority of nurses, which are women, leaving the country. And this really continues to bring the public health sector on its knees. Doctors are worked, um, they're very few trained. And again, it feeds into the narrative that the private sector is better, is more efficient, because that's where you know you will you will find healthcare. But at the same time, it means that the regulation of the entire health system is to its knees. Um, my mother's on here and she broke her arm a couple of weeks ago and we went to three different hospitals to try and find an x-ray machine that was working and these are Nairobi's best private hospitals and it speaks to a lack of regulation for the entire health system. And if the public health sector isn't working for sure the private system is you know running on its own without any counter checks or, or regulation or accountability really. And so unless we're able to pull back and really uphold the social contract and really hold our governments to account on one end, but also untangle ourselves from this entanglement um, that we find ourselves in with private finance, um, delivery, public service, 
uh, public services and goods that really should be in the hands of our governments and in the hands of our governments to provide lives that are viable and and that are universally accessible for all its citizens. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Cristal, again, for kind of poignantly highlighting the implications for the daily lives of people of these approaches um, that, that prioritize the private um, over the public. Um, I'm aware that Luis uh, has been able to pop a question in the, in the chat, and I think this one is, oh. ah, you can speak, Luis, you can, you can take sorry. over. <laughs> I'm very sorry, I've been having technical issues. Uh, I was going to um, ask a question that's now in a chat that maybe you can see, which is, you know, we've been um, exchanging views with the bank for a long time. And I was wondering from the panelists what you think is the likelihood of any change in their approach? Um, and what would be required for the bank to change its approach? Are there, are there structural are there structural issues within the bank? Are there, you know, obviously a, a combination of geopolitical and other factors that are necessary for alignment and to bring about a, a change in policy? Can can we perhaps ask Daniela and 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 then Maria Jose to to share their views on what's the likelihood of there to be any change in the bank's approach and or, or what would be required for such a change? to manifest itself uh, okay uh, luis always asks the easy questions uh, uh, but first let me let me just uh, uh, express a, a very very um sort of familiar feeling listening to crystal i i, re I re remember that i'm a migrant in the uk but i come from romania that has exactly the same narrative crystal as you do which is the public health system is shit, uh, the public private uh, health system is much better, we should all move towards the private health system. Uh, and, and I think this shows the universality of, of the experience of having lived with the Washington Consensus for 30 years. I mean, we are where we are because our public health system has been severely decimated by 30 years of structural adjustment, more or less. So it's uh, it's it's the same there. I'm I haven't used a private health system there, so I'm I'm wondering. But uh, my sister has, and the, the reports are not glowing either. Uh, back to Luis's question. Uh, to me, I think to to understand. I to me, the World Bank is simply. Uh, um, a, an agent and uh, a structural consequence of, of much bigger sort of um, pa power structures and power relations and and uh, in order for for the world bank to change its direction i think what would need to happen is that financial capitalism in the way that it has been becoming increasingly dominant over the last 30 years uh, um, disappears and so we i don't think that the world bank alone uh, changing the World Bank alone would be enough for this maximizing finance for this logic to go away. Uh, quite the contrary, what I see is, uh, if you look, I mean, I call it the Wall Street consensus, not just because the World Bank is there, but every multilateral development bank, the G20 has an infrastructure as an asset class program. Everyone that I can think of uh, that is uh, in sort of global elite uh, decision-making circles uh, thinks the same, that this is the way forward. And for, for things to change, we need somehow some really about uh, sort of explosions in, in 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 the logic the structural logic of of capitalism as we have it today is it possible for this to happen uh, who knows maybe if there is a civil war in the us because donald trump doesn't accept the consequences of losing the election maybe uh, that that is um, my solution has nothing to do with the Bretton woods project i'm afraid <laughs> or what louise can can do with the civil society organizations but uh, i am also quite aware of the limits of of mobilizing from the fringes of this uh, 40 people <laughs> web, sp web space uh, i would say at least become be as uncomfortable as possible uh, it to, is, is my message uh, and i think that's why some of us in, in this space are also uh, identifying as uh, activist academics uh, as in we we go beyond the academia and trying to sort of identify the politics of what is happening now but uh, uh, let me ask you luis i mean you you are rubbing uh, shoulders and uh, <laughs> I, 
elbows more with the World Bank than I do. Uh, we know from, I, I've now gone to for three years to their annual meetings, and my sense is that there are lots of people inside the World Bank or inside the, or the representatives of, of G20 countries to the World Bank that are nice people uh, faced with very uh, complex situations and they accept, the, they accept uh, the status quo because they don't see alternatives. So I don't know. I'm, I'm very skeptical that there is much that can be changed unless there is significant change in the, at the core of, of the system which is the U.S. and the way in which financial capitalism is basically um, has taken over political power and then it's moving it around. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. With you. Just to get, um, I, I want to give the floor to uh, Maria Jose because I'm, I presume she has strong opinions also. But uh, I, I think one of the things that is interesting to watch with from within the bank and the IMF, I think, is that I think that it's not the instability of the system is not totally lost upon them either. So I think there is some grappling inside the institution around, you know, what what to do. But uh, Maria Jose, um, since Daniela doesn't think BWP can do much about it, maybe your dad can. What are your thoughts on this? Thank you for the very provocative question, um, and uh, thank you, Daniela, also for your, for sharing your, your thoughts. Um, I could agree with with Daniela that the that the change is quite um, unlike, uh, unlikely to, to happen, right? Uh, we are not in front of a, um, a, a change. Um, and, and if, if the, the, the COVID crisis uh, being the, the kind of crisis that, that we are seeing these days is not able to actually um, uh, provoke a, a, a change or a reflection, even a reflection from the bank, um, we we really have to go along the lines of what Daniela suggested. Um, I will also like to add that um, the World Bank is not a monolithic institution. The World Bank is a very complex institution as such, and it has 75 years, 76 years of history. So as such, I am seeing the World Bank as an institution that promotes this model, uh, the, the one that we are discussing now, but also an institution that reflects uh, broader, broader dynamics uh, and that has to do with some of the things that Daniela, that Daniela uh, mentioned. Um, and so the, the change will not only come from within the World Bank, uh, so it's going to be uh, way more uh, complex uh, than, than that. But for sure, as you said, the, there are um, 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 possible um, um, leverage points inside the institution to, to get at least to a different type of conversation. Um, and I guess that this is the hope that we should all have. Uh, but, but yeah, it's not simple. We have, Thank a, you. we have a couple of questions on the chat now. So we have one from Elizabeth Bullrich, which is, Daniela mentioned the threats poor countries face in losing market access to debt relief, what would be a remedy? And then if I may just have the two questions, there's another question, one for Urania, um, Urania and Maria Jose. Your graphs display the bulk of COVID-19 emergency finance going for financial institutions. Does the World Bank actually disclose the, the types of financial institutions they are financing? What would you see? Would you see some financial institutions could be better from a social impact perspective to support than other types? Also, what impact of indicators should private finance, financiers of development measure to ensure finance could support social impact? So one about the, the debt situation and one in terms of the financial sector uh, being supported. So Daniela, would you like to answer the first question? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Elizabeth. I think that's a it's a it's a very good question, and it doesn't have a straightforward answer. I mean, I wouldn't say that the rating agencies are are the ones uh, the the sort of public enemy number one here, in the sense that uh, uh, the the threat of market access comes from uh, bondholders. And uh, if you, I would suggest that you read the entire post of, if you, if you Google Brad Setzer, uh, you will find the, uh, the post where he describes how uh, 
the uh, negotiations around uh, debt relief and, uh, uh, and suspension of um, debt service have evolved over time. The political economy of these negotiations has evolved over time because in the 1980s and 1990s, the, the commercial creditors were typically commercial banks. And now the commercial creditors are bondholders and most of them, it's a very concentrated ownership in most, although there are some debates around uh, poor countries, but it's typically uh, concentrated uh, ownership from the large asset managers, typically in the US, right? So in a sense, the, the, if you look at the experience of Argentina, and I'm not a, an expert in, in, in debt uh, renegotiations, I actually don't particularly like the topic, but somehow I stumbled onto it for, for reasons that have to do with the way in which the Wall Street consensus is evolving now. But the, the, the main uh, sort of uh, obstacle and the, the threat of market access comes from uh, large bondholders who are asset managers ma managing money on behalf of institutional investors like pension funds, like my pension fund here, I'm sure is invested in Aberdeen Asset Management. Aberdeen Asset Management has, uh, uh, for example, has been very instrumental in leading the group of institutional investors that are negotiating with Zambia. And here, I guess, the, the broader uh, geopolitical context in which we are now is very important as well because uh, the the uh, debt renegotiations for the the countries that are eligible. There are 73 countries that are eligible for the, the debt suspension, debt service suspension initiative. Only 43 ha have applied. Uh, there, some of the remaining ones are at high risk of debt distress, but they haven't applied because of market access. And uh, what uh, private bondholders are saying is, we don't want uh, mandatory involvement, and we also we are only prepared to negotiate on a uh, uh, country to country basis and when they negotiated with Zambia and this is I guess is going to affect every country in, in Africa much more than com uh, countries in uh, on other continents because Chinese investments are much significant there but there is a geopolitical struggle between the US and China that is taking place in this space uh, that is allowing private creditors to, to very effectively leverage this political, these geopolitical disputes into doing nothing. So what private creditors are saying now to Zambia is, as long as you don't get China's state on banks on board with debt relief, we won't, we won't negotiate with you. You can go in default. And this is, this is now the position of the G20. And to me, this illustrates very, very clearly that the kind of partnership that uh, one uh, has imagined or the World Bank imagines we should have with the private uh, financiers of development is one where poor countries always lose uh, and private so, creditors Daniela, one way or another always win. I'll finish. Sorry, Daniela. I'm just saying yeah, thank you. Just so that the other question can be answered as well. Uh, Rania, would you like yeah. to answer Yes, yes, question? I'm going to start over, but uh, Maria Jose or Elisa can join in whenever, whenever you want on that. Uh, okay, that's a, um, that's a multifaceted question, or there, there are lots of sub-questions, okay, on the first part. Uh, yes, the IFC is disclosing what type of financial institutions the they different uh, COVID response uh, projects go to. Having said that, this is for the projects that are publicly available to us. There are loads of other uh, COVID response projects that are uh, not disclosed yet or are disclosed with a considerable delay, for instance, the projects under the um, uh, Global Trade Finance uh, um, COVID uh, response facility of the IFC will only be uh, released with a year lag. So we don't know many of the projects, hence we don't know the financial institutions. But for those that are disclosed, we do have um, information about uh, the financial institutions that are being financed. Um, uh, now, whether we could see, we, we could say that some financial institutions could be better in terms of social impact than others, I mean, we have to define social impact first, but I mean, in general, I mean, one could say yes, but I think what is important to look into here is, is what are the criteria upon which the IFC is uh, selecting, if, if you will, uh, the uh, financial institutions as part of the COVID response, as, as part of the emergency COVID response. And for example, those criteria have to predominantly do with existing clients. So they are, uh, all the, the, the COVID response projects go to existing clients, uh, which is a criterion, if you will, that is above whatever a different socialist impact one financial institution may have from another. Yes, that's number one. Uh, number two, again, uh, as, as it has been highlighted by lots of uh, empirical work 
by by the World Bank and, and many other institutions, of course, who is being most adversely hit by the uh, COVID pandemic are the micro and the small and medium um, enterprises, so the MSMEs. And this, uh, I, this approach to then uh, land or to use these projects to support financial institutions has within it embedded this um, presumption that these funds will then, through whichever financial institution is a client of the IFC, will then be reaching those uh, M MSMEs, although there is uh, uh, no evidence uh, of uh, that. Uh, I'll say one last thing for the last part of the question, and then I'm going to uh, to see if Maria Jose wants to add something else. Now, whether we can create all sorts of different metrics uh, in terms of impact um, indicators, um, Yes, presumably we can, and they have, I mean, we, they, they do exist all sorts of different metrics that want to see which uh, financial institution is um, uh, lending where, if you will. Uh, but, I mean, in, in, in my opinion and from, from, um, from different, um, if you will, um, support from, from, from the literature, uh, what one has seen is that, uh, I mean, who is impacted? So who are the end beneficiaries, okay, of different projects or of different operations or financial institutions is very much indeed a context dependent rather than, see what I mean, a um, box ticking exercise of a set of measures that uh, we, should, uh, uh, we should be looking at. I'm leaving this to see if uh, Maria Jose or Elisa want to um, add anything to that. Lisa, do you want to go? Or? No, Maria Jose, no. that's fine. I think Urania has summed up quite nicely in response to I am, I am, I am also fine, thank you. It's really great. Can I yeah. um, just uh, two quick things to add from the floor? One of which is just in response to the second question. Is I think it's quite interesting that when the IFC itself measures the impact of their the their projects their highest weight goes to, towards the financial sustainability of their own investments which i think says a lot about how they you know um they frame their their activities and then one uh, question of that i just wanted to say that you know apropos of my uh, comment and that uh, echoing a little bit what um, maria jose said you know the bank I think the bank realizes that things are quite unstable, and so do the, the people at the fund. For example, yesterday, um, Malpass, President Malpass of the bank, spent quite a long time talking about the need to have a different, more organized system for debt restructuring. You know, which in some ways is strange because we've been calling for something like that. But then, you know, um, whether that implies that, he, you know, the bank and the shareholders would support a UN, you know, a debt workout mechanism outside of the bank and the fund is something else. But I think there are interesting dynamics around the, the recognition of the instability of the current system, which I think is quite uh, useful uh, to, to note, uh, I suppose. I don't know. Um, there are no other uh, questions uh, on the chat. So... Before passing over the floor to Lisa for maybe a few closing remarks, I just want to say, you know, from someone who's been working on this for a long time as well, I think this report is particularly uh, useful and timely because we often get, you know, we as suicide, et cetera, often get accused of having an anti-private sector bias, you know, that we often get told by the IFC and the World Bank and others in the IMF that, you know, that we... Um, we don't recognize the, the necessity of having a private sector engaging in employment generation, economic development. And I think this, this report shows that that's not true. It's the nature of the structures of the private sector that really concern us and the role of the bank in supporting that. So I really appreciated the, the report. Very useful. Thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to participate. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to Elisa. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Louise, and thanks everyone for joining. Thanks to our wonderful panelists for, for uh, being here with us uh, today and, and throwing a lot out there for us to take back home. Um, for those who are interested in the report, you will find it uploaded either on the Eurodat website or on the events page of uh, this particular uh, webinar. And uh, I want to also remind you um, 
that there is another very interesting webinar that is going to take place at uh, the same time, uh, same place next week, Wednesday, uh, 21st of October, and uh, we'll be joined by Naila Kabir, who is going to do a feminist deconstruction of critique of uh, what the randomistas mean for uh, economics. So please join us again uh, next week at the same time uh, through uh, the, the events page of the SOAS Economics um, uh, website. And so with that, I'm, uh, I'm happy to close the session. This was great and I enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot for everyone for coming and thanks a lot to our, to our speakers. And, uh, Wishing you all a very nice uh, evening.